Today we're going to talk about solutions and their properties. Now, solutions, we actually talked about that term a long time ago. Um, you might remember a solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture. That means it's a uniform mixture. Um, if I were to take sugar and place it in water and stir it up, you wouldn't see the sugar crystals anymore because they've gone into solution. The, the mixture itself is uniform. It's one phase. In this unit, we're going to talk about water solutions primarily, but all solutions do not have to contain water. Air, for instance, is a solution of two gases, primarily nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, 14 karat gold is a solution of gold, silver, and copper. They are all homogeneous mixtures, and they're all considered solutions. But once again, in this particular context, context we're, we will be talking about water solutions. Now, a solution is made out of two components, the solvent and the solute. The solvent is the part of, part of the solution that does the dissolving. That's a pretty simplistic definition, but it works well for us right now. It's usually present in the greater amount. The solute gets dissolved. Once again, a very simplistic definition, but it works very well for our purposes right now. And that is present in the lesser amount. So let's say I had a beaker, uh, and it has one liter of water in it. You can all imagine this, I'm sure, H2O, and I have a teaspoonful of sugar. I'm trying to draw a teaspoon there. There's my sugar. When I add my sugar to the water, the sugar gets dissolved by the water. Therefore, the sugar is the solute. It gets dissolved, and it's present in the lesser amount, and the water, of course, is my solvent. It does the dissolving, and it's present in the greater amount. Now, two other terms that we're really not going to talk about too much in this unit because they're not solutions or homogeneous mixtures are suspensions and colloids. So suspensions and colloids are both heterogeneous mixtures. That means they're not uniform throughout. The difference is suspended particles are so large that they will settle out upon standing. So suspended particles will settle upon standing. Like sand and water. However, colloidal particles, they're so small, the water molecules actually cause them to stay suspended and they won't settle upon standing. The classic example of a colloid would be something like homogenized milk. The butterfat globules in milk will stay suspended and they won't settle out to the top or to the bottom. So they won't settle upon standing. The difference is the size of the particles and whether or not they will settle upon standing. But once again, these two terms we're really not going to talk too much about in this unit. We're going to focus our discussion on solutions and their properties. So let's talk a little bit about why things dissolve in water and why things will not dissolve in water. So let's take sodium chloride. Um, NaCl. If I can get my pen to work here. Come on, there we go. If I were to take a crystal of sodium chloride solid, the chloride ions are larger than the sodium ions. They are the green spheres and the sodiums are the silver spheres. Notice I added a charge to these. Remember, sodium loses electrons to chlorine um, to form stable octets. And that gives sodium a positive charge and a chlorine, uh, the chlorine the negative charge. And there's an electrostatic force of attraction between the two that causes the ionic bond. Now, when I place sodium chloride in water, 
water molecule literally starts to surround those different ions. Take a look right here. Here's my sodium ion. You can see that it's positive. And if you remember, water has a positive and negative end. The oxygen part of water is negatively charged. It's more electronegative than the hydrogens. And so this negative end, the oxygen end of water, forms an attraction for the sodium ions. And it literally begins to surround the sodium ions. The water is more attracted to the sodium ions than the sodium ions are attracted to the chloride ions. So it starts to surround them. And likewise, my chloride ions, they're negatively charged. The positive part of my water molecules the hydrogens begin to surround the chlorides. They have an attractive force because they're positive to the negative chlorides. The chlorides are more attracted to the water molecule than they are to the sodiums. So the water molecules surround the chlorides. Now, as a solid, sodium chloride cannot flow. But when it's surrounded by water molecules, it becomes part of the liquid and it can now flow. And so these sodium and chloride ions flow away from the crystal, and eventually the entire crystal can become dissolved in the water because all of those water molecules can surround the sodium and chloride ions. So down here at the bottom, remember water we call a polar molecule. It has a positive end and it has a negative end. Salt, sodium chloride, also has a positive and a negative end. As a result, water can dissolve compounds that have positive and negative ends. However, if it doesn't have a positive and negative end, if it's nonpolar, water cannot dissolve things that do not have a positive and negative end because they're not attracted to those molecules or particles. So, let's pick on something that does uh, that doesn't have a positive and negative end. Let's pick carbon tetrachloride. If I were to draw the Lewis structure for carbon tetrachloride kiddos, it would be tetrahedral. And it would be nice and symmetrical. And all of the dipoles will cancel each other. So carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. It cannot dissolve polar solutes because it doesn't have positive and negative ends. So it can't dissolve something like water. Likewise, it can't dissolve ionic compounds like sodium chloride because sodium and chloride have positive and negative parts, but carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar, it doesn't. It turns out, however, it can dissolve other nonpolar solutes. Oil, for instance, or grease can be dissolved by carbon tetrachloride. So we end up with this very simple solubility rule. It's three words long. Like dissolves like. And that simply means that polar solvents can dissolve polar solutes or solutes that have positive and negative ends, like ionic compounds. So polar dissolves polar. The other part of this rule is nonpolar solvents can dissolve nonpolar solutes. So nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So like dissolves like simply means polar dissolves polar, and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Now I have a nice little demonstration video uh, for you to be able to see this in action that you should watch in conjunction with this lecture video, and hopefully that will make more sense of what I'm talking about. All right? All right, next time we'll talk about these three terms, saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated, and I'll have another demonstration video for you. So that's it for now, kiddos. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.